Hello everyone and welcome to Month of Romance 19 Love Songs with David Levithan. I'm Allison Carvalho, the events manager for Barbara's Bookstores. Barbara's has been a Chicago institution since 1963 and we are so incredibly excited to be hosting this virtual event. We are a family owned and operated bookstore and we pride ourselves on creating community spaces within our stores as well as outside of them like these events. Before we get on to our discussion today, I want to give you a quick tour of Crowdcast for those of you who haven't used it before. Firstly, we are a virtual, we are new to virtual events and to Crowdcast. We've been doing this for a little while, but we're still figuring out some of the kinks. So please be patient with us in case anything comes up or we have any technical difficulties. We will get things back up and running as quickly as we possibly can. Please make sure to chat with other book lovers in the chat on the side. We'll also be providing links with information about book recommendations as well as other upcoming events that we have. If you notice that your video is experiencing any kind of lag or it's freezing, go ahead and click on the little gear option and then click it and change the HD setting to 360. That tends to help with any lag you might be experiencing. The last 10 to 15 minutes of the event will be open for questions. So please make sure if you have a question you wanna ask this incredible author, please make sure to pop them in the ask a question function that's at the bottom of the screen. If you click on it, it pops up, you can type in a question there. And then if you don't necessarily wanna ask a question but you wanna see what other people wanna ask, make sure to check it out and you can upvote other people's questions. It's a great way to participate in the event. Now, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you're gonna see a little green button that says click here to buy 19 love songs. Highly recommend clicking this button. It's a great button to click because it gets you to our website where you'll be able to purchase this amazing book. Um, we also are offering a 10% off discount for people who are attending the event. And you can put the word event at checkout in the like as a discount code, and you'll be able to get a 10% discount on the book. So I highly recommend clicking on that link down there. And lastly, we always wanna make sure that all of our events are informative and fun and welcoming. So please make sure to be as respectful and kind to your fellow book lovers as you can in the chat as well as throughout the event. Alrighty, I think that's everything. So I'm gonna go ahead and we are going to bring up our moderator for the event. Jeff Adams is the co-host of the Big Gay Fiction Podcast, creating the podcast for avid readers as well as passionate fans of gay romance fiction. Each week, author interviews, book recommendations, and explore the latest in gay pop culture. He's also an author, having written stories since he was in middle school. He writes both gay romance as well as LGBTQ young adult fiction, usually with a hockey player at the center of the story. I'd like to welcome to the screen... Jeff Adams. And good to see you. Hi, good to see you too. Thank you so much for coming back and moderating with us. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here for, for David today. Me too. All right, I'm going to go ahead and get myself off screen so you can talk about David. I'll see you in a bit. All right. Thanks, Allison. So let me introduce David Levithan for you. Uh, when he's not writing during spare hours on weekends, David is the editorial director at Scholastic and the founding editor of The Push Imprint, which is devoted to finding new voices and new authors in teen literature. His acclaimed novels, Boy Meets Boy and The Realm of Possibility started as stories he wrote for his friends for Valentine's Day. And that's something he's been doing for 22 years and counting. Uh, both of those happened to turn themselves into teen novels. He's often asked if the book is a work of fantasy or a work of reality, and the answer is right down the middle. He says it's about where we're going and where we should be. I'm excited to welcome to the screen David Levithan. Hello there. Hello, David. Thanks so much for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me here. I love that last little bit in your in your intro <laughs> about it's about where we're going and where we should be. I think that captures so much of your writing so well. I, I think I heard you say once that, in fact, you like to write the world as you want it to be right. uh, so often. And that's I think that's so great in the world that we're in right now. <laughs> no, absolutely. And, and, and I've learned because, I mean, Boy Meets Boy came out 17 years ago now that sometimes when you write the wor world as you want it to be, then give it enough time and slowly the, the arc of history curves that way. And it's more realistic than you thought at the time. Yeah, which is fantastic. We got to keep writing forward that way. Yeah. 
So today we're here to talk about 19 love songs, which is exactly what this book is. It's so wonderful. Describe it for us in your own words. Um, it is it is a collection um, of different pieces, some fiction, some nonfiction, some you can't tell whether they're fiction or not. Um, but it's basically 19 riffs on love um, and 19 stories about love um, that basically accumulated over many years. And I decided to basically, I love making mixes and mixtapes and mix CDs. So I basically made a mix of these stories and put them together in a way, hopefully, that they they work as a whole as well as individually. It's such a lost art, the mixtape. Yeah. It's not the same making a playlist as it yeah. was creating those things. And I love that you do it with stories. How did you select these particular stories for the collection? Because it's a bit of a mix of things that have been published in various places, but also things that are for the first time coming in, into print. I mean, it really, it, it was, it was, going through the, the laptop and going through the, the file and saying like, what, what do I have here? Um, as I'm sure we'll talk about, I do write a Valentine's story every year. So, so it had been about a dozen years since my last collection. So that was roughly 10 of the 19 stories probably came from that. Um, and, and then if there were holes, just seeing which holes I wanted to fill and writing a story. Um, interestingly, originally the book was called 21 um, Love Songs and and as I gave it to my editor, his name Nancy Hinkle, who has edited pretty much all of my books, I thought, you know what, two of these don't quite fit, but I'm going to see what she says. And sure enough, I got my editorial letter from her and she was like, I love it, but I have to tell you, two of the stories don't quite fit. I was like, all right. And she's like, are you going to write two more? And I was like, no, we are going to change the title and it's going to be 19 love songs instead of 21. And so it is. I think most authors would be envious at the idea just to easily just toss a couple things out that don't work rather right. than rewrites. <laughs> and and you should now have a deluxe version of the collection as like you right. know, the uncut songs. <laughs> right, including songs that don't fit. Yeah. <laughs> How did you get this going of writing the Valentine's Day story? How did that begin? I mean, the, the, the origin story is that um, it started in physics class in high school. Um, it's not a spoiler to say that I did not enjoy physics class in high school. I took it because my friends were in it. Um, science was not nearly as fascinating to me then as it is now. Um, and so I was bored and I had my physics book. And so I decided what I would do is I would find all of the puns for romance in the physics book. So opposites <laughs> attracting, oh, they have chemistry. Um, and I wrote a short story called A Romantic Inclination, which is in my my first collection, How, How They Met. And I finished it in January and was like, what should I do with this? And Valentine's Day was coming up. And I always, I was not a big fan of Valentine's Day. I thought it was, it was overly commercial. It put a lot of pressure on it. And if you were single, then what did you do? So I was like, I'll just, I'm going to Xerox it and give it to my friends for Valentine's Day. It'll just be my Valentine for them. Um, and I did. Um, famously, my phys I gave one to my physics teacher, which was daring because I, I felt that it sort of outed me as having not paid attention to his class. He thought it just was creative and, and wanted to submit it to Physics Teacher Magazine. And I was horrified. I was like, no, this is not going to be the first place I am published. Um, he, then, so he did not. But that should have been that. And then the next year, my senior year of high school, January came around and my friends were like, so what are you writing this year? And I, I tried to get out of it and said that this was not meant to be a thing. Um, but no, it was a thing. They, they were like, no, it's a thing. So I wrote another story. And so once you've done it twice, I, it, it's 30, how many years later? Um, 32 years later, 33 years later. I'm still doing it. Um, so it just is the one deadline I have every year. <laughs> and eventually they make it into a collection. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> that that was not, I, I think it's safe to say that that 16 year old David was not thinking, oh, in 2020, <laughs> my older self is going to be talking about the second collection of stories he's done. I, I don't think that was on his radar. He was just bored in physics class. I love that you had friends at 16 who were supportive enough of your writing 
to say, hey, where's the next story? I don't know that I would have shared writing at 16 with anybody <laughs> outside of my English teacher, maybe. <laughs> well, it's funny. The, the book is dedicated in part to my parents and then in part to two friends from high school, Mei Ling and Linda, who were two of the people who were most encouraging and who most might, one might even say demanding um, of me to continue to write and they would read whatever it was. And, and so, so the, the dedication says they were there at the start. And I really do think that they were, that, that if they had not encouraged me so much in high school, I don't know that I would have gone on the path that I went on. That's awesome. And I think your physics teacher may be underestimated a little bit because you obviously <laughs> were paying attention enough to find the puns. Right, right. Just You just don't want me building a bridge based on that. <laughs> <laughs> very. That's probably very true, yes. So many of the stories in 19 love songs manage to play with all my emotions at once because there's so many things going on. One of the stories that I really just love that went from I'm laughing, I'm cringing at what's happening. There's this wonderful love, you know, wonderful kind of, I wouldn't call it happily ever after because this couple's together at the start, but it revolves around Taylor Swift. Yeah. And the story is called The Woods. And it really digs into the idea of your inner relationship. And there's those moments where you reveal something that maybe not everybody knows that might make other people cringe. And in this case, it's Taylor Swift. Where did this story come from? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the, the honest truth is that, so I've said I have one deadline every year. It's February 14th. So usually what happens is around January 30th, I go, oh my God, I need to write a story in two weeks. What is it going to be about? Uh, maybe maybe it's a week earlier, but but usually it's that, that deceptive turn of the year. I'm like, oh, I have plenty of time. And then it's January. I'm like, oh, I have no time. And that year, um, it was definitely the, the year after 1989 came out, her, her album 1989, um, which was very much like the album of the year for me and on repeat. So... And it must have been on. I was like, well, what if I, what if, what if you were dating somebody who wrote Taylor Swift fan fiction and you were not a Taylor Swift fan? I mean, it's, it's, it's the, it's sort of a riff on the old, what if you fall in love with the person who loves dogs and you hate dogs? Um, so what, how would that play out? And basically the, the, I wrote the story to see how it would play out. Um, and it's funny because I'm not, I, I'm, Genuinely, I'm writing from the point of view of the person who doesn't understand Taylor Swift at all, whereas I am not a devoted fan, but I, I like especially that album. So it was that interesting give and take um, of sort of plumbing both sides of my own feelings about Taylor <laughs> Swift in these two characters. And I'm, I'm not, I, I listen to her music. I'm not a devo devoted, you know, know everything about her either, but... I feel like you may have had to do some research in here because you really dig into some Taylor Swift <laughs> stuff and what those songs meant. And, <laughs> you know, and did you have to kind of go over the, it, it, into all that in the couple of weeks you had to write it? I mean, the, 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 the scary truth is no, no. I mean, and, and it's like, where, where, how, how do I know that like she and Selena Gomez are friends and Selena Gomez and Justin Bieber go uh, are on and off again? Like, of course, before his marriage. Um, Again, it was just in the ether. I had internalized more of it than I thought. Um, and so, so like the little bits and pieces of her that are in there, again, I just picked up along the way. But for me, it really is for, I, I'm not crazy about Taylor Swift, but I love Taylor Swift's music. Um, and so for me, so the purest sections of that story are really when you taught, when it is about the music and about the effect the music has. And the title comes from the song Out of the Woods which the first time I heard it just blew me away and still is probably my favorite of her songs. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to sort of convey some of that in the story that I was writing. Music comes back over and over again. We'll talk about a couple more stories in 19 love songs that are tied to music, Nick and Nora's infinite playlist. I mean, it goes on and on your music. Was music kind of a love before writing or have the two always been kind of tied together? Oh, they're definitely tied together. I mean, I, I definitely, I've always listened to music all the time. Um, 
I just with friends watched Xanadu on Saturday night to just relive my 1980 Olivia Newton John <laughs> glory. But like that was, I mean, I was, I was the eight year old who was like listening to my Xanadu cassette obsessed, but I was also obsessively reading the Westing game. So I don't know how the two meld, but that's the, those are my two major influences. And with Boy Meets Boy, I, I was very consciously sort of inspired by the writer Francesca Lea Block. I was like, oh, a novel can be a pop song. And how do I make a novel like a pop song? Like that, that was my goal with Boy Meets Boy. And sometimes that is my goal with the stories that I write or novels that I write. Other times I really have to rein it in. I mean, one of the, the harder things about writing the everyday books is that the main character every day who changes bodies every day is not a, a pop culture person at all. Like A, a is, is living on a different plane and so it was very funny that I, I was like, okay, I must control. That is not a defining characteristic of this character. I must not put myself in there in that capacity. Whereas other characters, it's much more a part of their lives. And that I can relate to more. Mm -hmm. You, as I mentioned, you hit so many emotional moments in these stories, even when they're super short. Is it a challenge to hit so many of those moments in something that is that small? Yeah, oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I think writing a really good short story is just as hard as writing a really good novel. I think you have such a limited canvas and to make people feel something within 15 or 20 pages or even 10 pages, that's quite a challenge. Um, and I am always admiring. I think it is, especially in YA, it's a form that really we don't read enough of and, and promote enough. Mm -hmm. There are very few practitioners of short stories. Um, I think, I mean, partially it's a generational thing. I think my generation, we thought we had to write short stories before we graduated to novels. Now mm -hmm. sort of the NaNoWriMo ethos is that you basically go straight into novel writing. And I miss, I miss the short story phase because I think there is a lot to be said, both for your talents as a novelist, as well as a short story writer by learning how to do things short. Um, but for me, honestly, while I'm writing, I'm just in the story. And so what usually ends up moving the readers is something that I discover as I'm writing it and it moves me. Just those unexpected moments where the characters I've thrown together do something oftentimes that I was not expecting. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's the magic of writing to me is discovering that along the way and then hoping it conveys itself to the reader when they pick the book up. One of the sequel stories inside 19 Love Songs, uh, alongside ones for Boy Meets Boy, and, and uh, we've got one from Every Day, yeah, which is like one of my all-time favorite books. The way the way that you brought A to everybody just really grabbed me when it came out. For those who don't know what that is, and you've alluded to A a little bit, give folks a little bit of an overview of what that is, and then how you decided on the method to tell a story because it's really unlike a lot of YA fiction and just fiction we see out there in general, the way that that story is told. Yeah. I mean, every day again, started with a premise. It, it was basically what would your life be? What would your life be like if you woke up every day in a different body in a different life? And it had always been that way. And I did not know the answer to that question, but I basically wrote, <laughs> the novel in part to, to see what the answer was. And, and so many things that come from that, you have no gender, you have no race, you have no parents, you have no set friends, nature and nurture just get thrown out the window. Again, going into it, I didn't even think of the implications until I was in it. And then suddenly the implications were very much there. Um, and I decided that I would write the books that basically every day A does wake up in a new body and I don't plan things out. So basically, whatever the wherever i thought of first for a to b or whomever i thought a would be um when i started a new chapter that's who a would be so every day the first book starts when a is 16 years old and so we see a basically through through their 16th year um for the story in in 19 love songs one year for the valentine story i thought it would be really interesting to go back um, and to be like, what if, what if you were younger? What if you were a third grader um, and you were still waking up every day in a different body? And let's see a day in A's life 
younger. Um, and that's, that's where that story came from. Um, I'm fascinated by that. I think A is an interesting lens to look at different parts of life. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe someday I will, I will write a prequel or write something with A being younger, just because I think that would be a very different book than the ones that I've written. Um, but that story was me sort of testing that out. Yeah, and this one was really interesting because A is always interesting in that he's got this kind of, I say he, they <laughs> kind of <laughs> have this have this mantra where they try not to mess up the life they're in for the day. And they're doing everything in this story they can to make this day good for the mom who's taking care of them that day. And I just, it's so heartwarming and it's just another look at love, really. Yeah, no, I think, I mean, one of the things I love about stories about love is that they don't have to be about a romantic couple. Like you have love for your mom, you have love for your friends, you have love for your siblings. And, and I wanted the stories in this book to really reflect that. Um, and that one in particular, again, it was a Valentine's story. And I was like, you know what? I really, I haven't written about, about a mom and the relationship with a mom. And I think A especially would be such an observer to what that phenomenon is like. And so I really love trying to distill what that relationship was like through A's eyes. Mm -hmm. I, I hope you know, as a fan of this book, I hope you find a way to tell more of A's younger stories because okay. I think that'll, that'll be quite fascinating. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna take a little divergent course here and ask right. one of the questions that has come up because <laughs> you may not have an answer for it given what we said, but Tiff is curious what He's always wondered what A's favorite song would be. Huh. <laughs> um, again, having just said that, I, I don't know. I don't think of A in those terms. Um, I'm just going to put I you think, on the spot for a second. Well, no, I mean, what, what, what's interesting, I will, I will sidestep it by saying that, that in the book, um, A bonds with the girl, Rhiannon, who A ends up falling in love with. Um, and there's a lot made of the one song that they sort of listen to on the first day and it comes up a few times in the book. In my mind, I actually always thought it was Kelly Clarkson's Stronger, which is just a very upbeat sing along in the car with the windows down song. But for some reason I was like, I'm not gonna say that. It's actually more interesting if you if you don't know what song it is. But then for the movie, the the I believe the director chose it, um, chose a song called This Is The Day by The The, which in a strange like small world coincidence was my best friend in high school. That was the first song he ever put on a mixtape for me. It's literally track one, side one of the first mix he made for me, which the director had no idea. And it was the perfect song. I mean, it never would have occurred to me to use that song at that moment. But then the minute I learned that they were doing it, I was like, oh my God, that is perfect. So, so. Honestly, at this point now, if I were answering the question, it would be the does this is the day that was such a like spectacular choice. Um, but if you would ask me when the book came out, it would probably have been Kelly Clarkson. <laughs> it can have two songs. Yeah, exactly. That's totally fine. <laughs> and continuing on our music theme, All right. uh, possibly the longest title in the book. I didn't quite measure this out <laughs> to see for sure as the Philadelphia Queer Youth Choir sings Katy Perry's Firework, which is also not super easy to say. Right. Uh, again, another very different storytelling style here as you jump back and forth in the thoughts of the, of the choir literally singing the song. Um, you captured so many different types of teens here. It was really interesting. And I'm curious, like, how you pick the types of people you were going to feature kind of in that piece? I mean, that, that piece started to give credit where credit is due. I was asked to be a part of a book called Proud um, that a UK publisher published there. It's won a lot of awards over there, um, which was basically a number of, I mean, well over a dozen queer creators writing stories just about being queer today. And whenever you accept an assignment like that. I mean, or at least whenever I accept an assignment like that, I of course immediately become paranoid that I'm gonna write the same exact story as somebody else. And so I ask myself, okay, what, what can I do with my story that I'm pretty sure that nobody else will do? And so 
it happened that I was asked to write the story around the same time that there was a choral adaptation of my novel, Two Boys Kissing, which is extraordinary, um, which um, was composed by an amazing composer named Joshua Shank. Everybody, I encourage you to look it up. It is on YouTube. Um, and it was commissioned by the Twin Cities Gay Men's Choir, but then numerous other um, gay men's choruses did it, including the Philadelphia Gay Men's Chorus did it with the Columbus Gay Men's Chorus. And so I had just seen their performance of it. And of course, I went as many times as I could see it. And I was just struck by the dynamic on the stage. I mean, here, here are a number of gay men thrown together. They're rehearsing all the time. Um, some of them have dated. And so you're like, what, what, what must be going through their heads? And so I decided I would write a, a song um, trying to, to encapsulate all of the thoughts going through their heads during the span of one song. Um, and the Katy Perry's Firework just seemed like, what is like the most gay men's choir song there is to sing? I mean, I would argue for Firework. I, I feel that it, it's probably the canon of most, and if it's not, it should be. So, so that was why I chose it. Um, and so I, I literally would be there playing Firework over and over again, trying to make sure my timing was, was as accurate as could be with sort of different movements of the song. And as far as picking the different voices, it really was trying to reflect, I mean, you, you see these gay men's choirs or choruses, and it is, it is, it is a cross section. I mean, it is the, such diversity across every possible um, identity and an intersection of identities. So I wanted to try to reflect that as much as I could. And it's really interesting what you have running through their head. It's everything yeah. from what's this guy over here doing? And what are these people in the audience doing to, oh my God, what am I, what am I doing <laughs> sitting right. here on the stage? You know, I, I, how did you get in the headspace for it? I mean, that's, there's so many characters. And if you, you know, when you think about a basic story, there's usually, you know, the primary, the two primary characters, maybe some side characters. You've got a lot of characters in play here. I mean, I, I will, I will admit that I cheated. Um, and this is this is where, unfortunately, the the printed page is 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 not as good as my document online or on my laptop, because I gave every color I gave every character a different color, and so that was as I was writing. Again, it, it was very easy to switch from one to the other, or keep every storyline straight because I was like, oh, it's purple. Purple is seeing his father in the audience and is recalling what their experiences are. Oh my God, Red, Red keeps looking at Orange and Orange, uh, he doesn't know if Orange likes him or not. I mean, so so in many ways that was my cheat was that I, I sort of gave them the personalities and matched them with the colors and then later rearranged it on the page. So in a black and white book, you would be able to tell the different story or different voices apart. Mm -hmm. That's cool. You mentioned the choral adaptation. I just briefly want to touch on that. Yeah. You know, so often when we think about adaptations, it's like, will <laughs> it be a movie? Might it be a TV show? Might it be a play? To become a choral work is not the usual. <laughs> what was that whole thing like that it got adapted in that way? I mean, it was extraordinary. I mean, the book is written, um, is narrated by a, a first, or a, yeah, first person plural group of men. Mm -hmm. um the generation basically who passed away from aids looking down at the current generation um i will admit never i didn't even think of it as a chorus when i was writing the book it was my editor who was like oh it's narrated by the greek chorus i was like oh it is um but even then um the reason i do the i i i read the audiobook and the reason was i felt that the authorial voice was the closest you couldn't have a group of men reciting this together that would make for a very awkward audiobook. It didn't occur to me that a chorus might someday do it, but um, somebody at the Twin Cities um, chorus read the book and was like, "This this would be an extraordinary piece for our for our chorus," and they they got in touch with me, uh, my my poor agent, not used to dealing with contracts involving choral work. <laughs> so there was a learning curve for a lot of us, but did. Um, and then they hired um, Josh, the composer, and he just ran with it. Um, and I did not, I chose 
not to hear anything while it was being made. I, I wanted to show up there and just see it for the first time there, knowing that I would be sobbing the whole time, which I was. Um, but yeah, it's it's beyond the, my wildest dreams. I mean, I love, love, love the movie and TV adaptations of my work. But I think if I were to sort of take the one that's the most special to me, it would definitely be the choral adaptation, just because it is, it just transcends the, the source material in a way that I never would have expected. Mm -hmm. Everybody go look that up. So yeah, no, seriously. <laughs> it afterwards. Yeah. The final story in this collection, to me, I think is the most powerful. And as I was preparing to talk to you and kind of reread this, it took on even more, I think, important in the time that we live in right now. It's called Give Them Words. And you actually wrote it back in 2014 for the Freedom to Read Foundation. And it's really a love letter to librarians, teachers, booksellers, writers, and the work that they do day after day. And I'm going to take the leap to read just a bit of it here to give people a little bit of a tone for what's in this. You are here for the girl who sees college has her only way out, the gay boy who wants to get married, the lonely girl whose father hits her, and her brother who knows it's happening but doesn't know what to do. It's not all that heavy and deep now, because mm -hmm. later on you come in and say, if they do not know who they are, you give them words to provide the options. There's such a mix of emotion in the types of people that books impact. What's really your message for the folks in the in these professions today? We're all so socially distanced right now, and connecting the book to the right person gets more challenging. Yeah. How how can we overcome that a little bit? I mean, I I think I think librarians and booksellers are the most resourceful people I know, and so they will find a way to to get the word out about books, but. But I mean, the reason I wrote the piece was, I mean, it was twofold. It was because I work, as you said, in my day job as a publisher, um, I get to see sort of the industry from a different vantage point. And I, I appreciate that when they're lucky, authors are the, really the only ones who, who get the profound thanks. And, and when somebody reads a book that changes their life, they are much more likely to DM or email or or write to the author and say, your book changed my life. They very rarely, although sometimes they do, will go back to the bookstore where they bought it and said, you changed my life, or to the librarian who bought it for their library and say, you changed my life. And so I feel that because the, the author is the collector of the compliments and collector um, and firsthand witness of the changes that books can do, one of my jobs is to make sure to to pay it back to the people who put the books on the shelves to begin with. And so I'm always looking for opportunities, whether it's speeches or something like this, to, to point out that my, my books would just be sitting there waiting to be discovered without people actively taking them from the shelf and putting them in people's hands. Mm -hmm. For this in particular, it was the 40th um, anniversary of the Freedom to Read Foundation, which I encourage all of you to support. Um, because they are they are among the greatest defenders of books when they are challenged or when censorship is attempted. And it happened that um, the 40th anniversary was celebrated um, in a place where they had just gone through some brutal challenges. Um, and so the, the, the families who had basically defended the books and librarians who had defended the books in the community actually came to the event. And so specifically, mm -hmm. it was me wanting to to show them that what they did really mattered, not just for their community, but really for thousands, if not millions of kids and adults that they would never meet. And so that the Give Them Words was my attempt to encapsulate all of that in one piece. So so it, it is an outlier. It, it's, it's, it's as much a speech as it is a poem, as it is a story. Um, but again, when I was looking, making the mixtape that is this book, that absolutely felt like the, the great place to end it with gratitude, because I, I mm -hmm. think that is always a great place to end. Mm -hmm. Just a reminder to everybody listening, we're going to be doing some questions and answers coming up in about 10 minutes. So if you have anything, go ahead and stick it in the ask a question 
uh, button that's down at the bottom of the screen. If I can point right, it's right over there. Um, we've only talked about a fraction of the stories that are in 19 love songs. And if Barbara's bookstore gave me time, I'd talk about all of them with you. <laughs> but I'm curious of the ones that we haven't talked about, is there one that you would call out to, to, to our audience and that you really kind of want them to know about? Oh my goodness. Um, I should, I and should I know this is a little bit like, you know, picking know, favorite like, child and everything. One. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I, I love, I tell the story of how my parents met, which I love that story. I, I will say the one, there's one in there called story time, which I'm going to freely admit that it is one that again, I'm sure it was January. And I was like, I better write a story for Valentine's day. I wrote it very quickly. I probably proofread it twice. I sent it out to my friends. And then I completely forgot about it. Like truly that was the story that when I went back to my computer and was like, okay, now it's time to, to put a, this book together. I saw a file called story time and I was like, what, what is that? Did, did I, I, I must've written it. It's, it's on my computer. Um, and I opened it up and I, I, as I started to read it, I was like, oh, I, I think I do remember this. But I generally did not remember where it went or what it was about until I was reading it. So I had the strange sensation of reading something I'd written almost as if I were a reader. Um, and it, it really moved me um, in a strange way because it is, it's about basically when you're in a relationship and by circumstances out of your control, one of the, the, the boyfriend's lives just really starts to go bad. Um, just bad things happened. It's not that they did bad things. It is that bad things are happening to them. And how do you navigate that? Um, and so I really, I mean, I'm very glad um, it's in the book. Again, this book came out in January. I will say that, that right now I've gotten a lot of response to that particular story because I think it does connect to what we're going through now and, and trying to navigate tough times that are beyond your control. Um, and it means it means something differently to me now than it it did when I was putting the book together. So, so that one I will say again that that's sort of the sleeper surprise of the of the, the collection. Again, there are lots of stories in there that I've I've loved and I, I've been really I've enjoyed sharing. Um, and there, as you said, there are revisitations to various characters from previous books: Boy Meets Boy, Every Day, Two Boys Kissing. But that one is its own creation and. I'm just glad that it, it ended up in there. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that you mentioned how it looks at a relationship that goes through this rocky period. One of the things that, you know, we often consider when you think about the romance trope and, and everything that wraps around love, it's always about the meet cute to the happily ever after. And, you know, that's that. There are stories in here that follow that trajectory, but there's so many too like story time, like 12 months and a few others where it's like, these are people in a relationship and you're watching them navigate good times, bad times, you're navigate life. And it's just these interesting little tidbits that you've given us along the way and, and make these powerful stories. And it's, it's nice to see love looked at in that more like what happens after happily ever after is where some of these characters really are. Yeah. No, I mean, it, it, the, I mean, it, it partially, I mean, it, it's, I don't mean to, this is not putting it down in any way, but, but the reason my first collection was called How They Met in Other Stories was at one point while I was putting it together, I realized that almost all of the books were about, were about meeting and about falling in love and about that first part of a relationship. Um, it was not by design. A, again, that book had 10 years worth of stories, but for whatever reason, that was the, that was the part that I was writing about the most. And I think once I realized that I was like, okay, it's my first collection. It's, it's good to start at the start. But then after that, I truly have made a very deliberate attempt to not, not go back to the, how they met and not go back to the meet cute. Again, there are some stories in here that are deliberately that way. Again, the one where I talk about how my parents met as an echo because in how they met, um, there's the story of how my grandparents met. But for most of them, and with my novels as well, I, mm -hmm. I do want to actually focus now on the 
in the thick of it and how you navigate that much more than the the bliss of meeting because again bliss of meeting is fun I, this is a this is romance month i don't want to take away from that at all but i do i do think there are plenty of other aspects of love to explore and i'm lucky enough that as i get older i get to explore them in writing mm -hmm. Because there is keeping the romance going. Yeah. You have what sounds like a wonderful job to me, where part of it is really crafting the books and the authors of the future. Mm -hmm. um, a, is that aw as awesome as it sounds? <laughs> and what are some of the practicalities that are in that? No, I mean, I love, I mean, I started at Scholastic when I was 19. I have been there ever since, um, which is many years. Um, and... I just, I love being able to play with other people's words as well as my own and to empower other authors to write things that I never could dream of writing. I would never be good at writing. Um, it is so vital to have people writing authentic stories and putting them out in the world. And, and again, I think most authors, if not all authors believe this, um, but luckily because of my double life, I, I do have the day job where I can commission and empower and, and promote authors um, who are doing that. And, and the push imprint, which again is, is nearing its 20th anniversary, which is crazy, again, started of, about just finding, we wanted a whole new generation of YA authors and finding all first time authors and getting their voices out there. And it's amazing to me that it, it still continues. I mean, lately, most of the authors who are on there are queer voices, which I think is fantastic. I think, in 2003, when I started, um, the, the body of queer YA literature um, was not very wide. It was extremely white. It was extremely male. Um, and so it has been amazing over the past, especially the past decade, to see us becoming more and more inclusive and intersectional. And again, being able to present to the world all of these different authors rather than having the hubris of thinking that I could write any of these stories myself because I could not. How does the job and what you see there impact David the writer? Do you, do you just manage to essentially leave that at the office when you're done with the day and go to do your, your, your own creative work? Um, can you really separate them? I mean, strangely, I can. I mean, I, I always say that I, I was an editor for 10 years before I really became a novelist. And I think that was a good decade to build the wall between the two parts of my brain. I mean, and it goes also to my writing, just the way that I write. I mean, that I, again, I'm not a planner. I am not very conscious of the mechanics of the story when I'm in the story. Like basically when I'm writing, I'm in there I am with the, the sound of the words. I am with the characters. I'm not thinking about anything else. I'm not, so I'm not conscious of my day job. I'm not conscious of other books. I'm not deliberately strategizing to put anything in the book. Literally the story takes over and that's what ends up on the page. So I think, I think luckily because I am that kind of writer, it certainly, it certainly makes it easier to put the walls up. But then I do think, I mean, the part that I am conscious of is I get to see firsthand how important these books are and what effect they can have. And, and certainly that inspires me to no end. I am, I'm just as inspired by other author success as I am my own because it just every author success shows what YA books can do and how they can affect lives and society and identity. And so I get to be a really close spectator in my day job to how other people's books affect people. And that pride in, in that certainly affects what I do as a writer. Mm -hmm. Looking at some of our questions from the audience, uh, Delorean would like to know, since most of your stories are complex YA stories, what is it that, what is it that you find so compelling about characters in that age group? I mean, I love, I mean, I think it is the origin story of adulthood. I think that I love a finite amount of time to sort of try to see how people form who they are. Um, and I think it is a complex time. I, I think that there's a lot of questioning. I think there's 
a lot of stuff that can happen really fast. I mean, I look back at high school and like, it's a, I, I can't comprehend that all the things that happened and all the feelings I felt were all in one year. Like it, it just, it, it seems like it was so much longer than it really was, um, especially in retrospect. And so I, I love just informing that. And again, I think for me, the, the grand themes of my writing are about how we become who we become and how we connect to other people and, and how we learn empathy. And I mm -hmm. think looking at the teen years specifically for that, again, I, I think it's, it's a very important lens to look at those years. And I think you can use those stories to help other people figure out those questions in their real life too, which I don't, I don't feel adult literature does as much. I think it does it sometimes, but I, I think YA does it much more. Mm -hmm. Cheryl has a question about co-writing and how that works for you, because it, it can seem like a challenge at time, at times <laughs> for those who haven't given a shot at the collaboration thing. Right. I mean, no, I, I love it, obviously. Um, I <laughs> collaborate with so many people now. Um, but no, it, it is, I love it because, again, because I'm a spontaneous writer, it, it is playing off of somebody else's spontaneity. We never plan out the books ahead of time. We always alternate chapters, whoever I'm writing with. And you end up with a story that you never, either of us, uh, I'll use Rachel Cohn, who I've written mostly with um, as an example, you look at our books, Rachel and I would never have gotten these books individually. You, you have to have the combination of us and you have to have us playing off of each other to get Nick and Nora's Infinite Playlist or to get Dash and Lee's Book of Dares. And so I love that. I love that spirit of it. I, I think in part because I am an editor, I am not precious about the story. I, I know how to play well with others. And so for me, it's just exciting to, to be able to share something. And so everybody I collaborate with, or every time that I collaborate with somebody like Rachel, who I've collaborated with multiple times, I discover more things about my writing. Um, and I put out a story that I never would have put out otherwise. So I love it. But I will say, again, just to, to make clear my process, the alternating chapters part is key, because that means that each of us has a piece of the book that is ours. Um, and, and we still have control over our own chapters even though we have no control over the whole story. Mm -hmm. I do know people, um, I always use Holly Black and Cassandra Clare worked on a series that I edited called Magisterium. They actually could sit next to each other on the laptop and compose and finish each other's sentences and work together. I don't think I could do that with not just any of the people I've collaborated with, but anybody. Um, I think I still need the solitary, I'm writing this piece on my own and then the sharing part comes with the emailing it to whoever I'm writing with and then seeing what comes back to me. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that the people you've collaborated with are also, you know, writers such as yourself who are, you know, the pantsers of the group who don't plot. Do you think you could actually co-write with somebody who plotted? Well, it, the, the funny part is I actually inadvertently did. Um, one of the funny things about, again, the way that we do, I do collaborations is we don't really talk about them. We just do them. We don't, I don't want us to plot it. I just want to run with it. But then what ends up happening is you go on book tour with the person you wrote a book with, you're asked questions about your process and you suddenly discover things about the other person. So in this case, um, I wrote a book, which I love called, you know, me well with Nina LaCour, who's incredible. If you have not read her books, you must start with, we are okay. Um, or the disenchantments, either one of those. So we wrote this book again, we did it going back and forth. Um, it is basically her character um, is a lesbian girl who the love of her life is about to show up who she's never really met in person before. And my um, main character is a gay boy who has basically been in love with this guy forever and doesn't know how to break free of that. And so basically the book is about them helping each other um, and basically unlocking just a whole pride community around themselves. When we were on tour, um, we got the question about, oh, your process. And I was like, oh yeah, we just chewed it back and forth. And Nina said, this was actually the first book I've ever written sequentially. And I was like, what, what do you mean? And she's like, yeah, no, I, I'll write the middle. I'll write a chapter towards the end. I'll write at the beginning. 
I have an outline that I sort of stick to, and it's just whatever scene I want to write or is speaking to me, that's how I write. And I was like, oh my God, like, so I forced you to write linearly. And she's like, you did. So it was very funny, but I, I, you, I never in a million years from with the enthusiasm with which she was sending chapters back to me in a linear fashion, it never occurred to me that this was not how she usually did it. But her brain, her writer brain is worked or is wired a very different way from mine. But we only found that out after. <laughs> Would you have been able to roll with it if suddenly like chapter 27 showed up after chapter four? <laughs> I mean, again, it, it, part of me is like, <laughs> David, you, you've been writing a lot. You whatever have whatever, 25, 26 books out. It's about time you really tried something very structured. Like, just try it. Like, you, you're up for any other challenge. So, so who knows? Maybe one day I will agree to collaborate with somebody who is a really solid outliner who says, okay, we are going to hash out everything ahead of time and then we're going to fill it in whatever we feel like filling in. I think I'd be up to that challenge if I, if I, if I was pushed in that direction. I hope to hear about that someday. Yeah. That would be we'll fascinating. Listening, right? <laughs> <laughs> so Tiff has another really good question. You came back to three different books within 19 love songs. Are there other characters you'd like to revisit again at some point? I mean, <laughs> the, the easy answer is not particularly. Um, and, and I'm, I'm always surprised. Usually when a book is over, like for me, it is over. I, Rachel and I are very different this way. Rachel thinks about where the characters are 10 years later. I genuinely don't. Um, but, but in those cases, I was like, oh, let, let's, let's try going back to them or try a side story. I mean, right now, the, the, the next book I have coming out is the third Dash and Lily book, with Ra which Rachel and I wrote. It's called Mind the Gap, Dash and Lily. It comes out, unfortunately, on election day. On the plus side, you're not going to forget that it's coming out on election day. On the minus side, you'll probably have other things to do on election day than go out and buy the book. But anyway, pre-order it. Pre-order it from Barbara's Bookstore. But it is the third book. And again, we... We would never go back to Nick and Nora. We would never go back to Naomi and Eli. But for some reason, Dash and Lily was the was the pairing that we were like, you know what? We could keep coming back to this over and over again. And very fittingly, it was the one that somebody thought would make a good TV series. So the TV series is debuting probably in November um, on Netflix. And the idea is basically each season will match one of the books. So we are two books ahead of the the tv series hopefully we'll write a book four and there'll be a season two um but that for me that is the only the only cast of characters i've ever thought of continuously um even every day i did not think that i was necessarily going to write two more books but then the ideas came and i ran with them um so we'll see i would never close the door on anything but right now there isn't it's not no that's not true i almost made myself a liar I would love to write another invisibility book with Andrea Kramer. That that is actually that is the one that is open ended that we would love to go back to. So I don't think there's any solo book I want to go back to, but if I could go back to any other thing that I've written, that's what I would go back to. Cool. Dory Ann has another question as well. What is your favorite I am an author moment? like an experience or an opportunity that has happened to you because you're an author? Oh my God. I mean, I mean, genuinely my answer would usually be, I mean, that first night seeing the choral performance of two boys kissing was, was a highlight. I mean, maybe not the highlight, but that was something again, because they're the things you dream about. And then they're the things that are so far above what you could ever imagine. Um, so that that's one. I do think, I mean, the Will Grayson, Will Grayson tour, um, when I was with John Green and we were touring around and just seeing his devoted following that would come and how much the books meant to them. Um, that was, I mean, that was an extraordinary moment too, where again, it was on a bigger scale. Probably the highlight for me for that actually came later was at the National Book Festival um, where John and I were actually separate um, presenting our books, but it was a tent of like 600 people. My family was there. My niece was by two or three at the time. Um, and I got to wave to her and she waved back and the crowd all waved to her. 
And that was like, that was pretty amazing. So I think, I think on the grand scale, that's it. And then on the, the smaller scale, obviously it is anytime somebody writes to me and says how my books have meant to them. Um, again, what, whether it is helping them grappling with their identity, helping them realize there is a reason for living, um, helping them figure out how to talk to somebody they loved like that, that always gets me. Um, so, so I think it exists on both planes, but I, I've been very, very, very charmed as an author in that regard. And in addition to Dash and Lily that comes out in November, which Tiff says that we can certainly buy the book and vote that day. You certainly can. Things that can be happening in the same day. Right. Uh, if we jump into next year, February, just in time for Valentine's Day, uh, you've got the mysterious disappearance of Aiden S. coming out. What can you tease us with about that book? Huh. Um, it, it will be a tease. It is, it is my first middle grade. Um, and it is me basically writing the book that my fifth grade self would have loved. Um, it is about a boy whose brother goes missing um, and then comes back with a reason for being missing that nobody really believes. And so it's, it's about how it affects the brothers, how it affects the family, how it affects the community. And that is all I will say about it. It is going to be an extremely, extremely hard book to talk about. Um, but I'm really excited about it. Sounds like it'd be filled with spoilers if you yes, talked about it yes. too much. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, but, but yeah, it's, it's, it was really fun to write for younger for, for a change. What led you into middle grade at this point? I mean, honestly, it, it was the story. It was, I, usually it is, I mean, as with every day, it's a premise comes to me and if I can't stop thinking about it, um, then I have to write the book to play it out and see where it goes. And this one, I came up with the premise of the missing brother and sort of where the brother would say he was. And then I literally wrote the book to figure out how that would, how that would go. Um, and the reason there are twists and turns and hopefully surprising things within it is because I genuinely, I didn't know what the ending was gonna be until I was there. Um, and that was just a lot of fun to write. So I, again, I just let myself do that. Very cool. I mean, it is the advantage to being the pantser, right? Is that right. you can, you don't know where it's going. So it'll surprise you, surprise the reader. Everybody gets a surprise. Yeah. <laughs> and hopefully it's a good surprise. <laughs> and you can pre-order Mysterious Disappearance from Barbara's Bookstore too. The, the nice. link just popped into the chat. So that's a great thing. We're coming up on top of the hour. So we're going to be, we have to wrap up here shortly. Uh, I always love to hear from authors what their book recommendations are. What have you been reading this summer that the that the audience should be checking out? Oh my goodness, there are so many books. Um, I will, I mean, I've been home. I've been reading a lot. Um, I, I love um, the book, um, Where We Go From Here by Lucas Hocha. Um, he's Brazilian. So Hocha is actually spelled R-O-C-H-A. Um, it is a book that was is on push that I did not edit, but it is about three boys in Brazil um, dealing with sort of love, lust, and HIV. Um, one of them mm -hmm. does not know is basically we start seeing him getting an HIV test and sort of follow him on his journey and then follow two other boys on their journey, which again, I don't want to spoil by telling too much about, but it is, I mean, I think YA I love, but one of the things we're very short on is books in translation and certainly queer books in translation is almost unheard of. And it's just, it's remarkable because it, it, it came to life to me as if it was happening next door to me. Um, and it's just really beautifully done. Um, and I'll say there's another book, if I can tease to another book while I'm on the Brazilian translation YA kick, um, there's another book that's coming out called Here the Whole Time, which is a Taylor Swift reference um, by Vitor Martins. And it comes out in November and it is basically about a boy who has body image issues and just basically just very doubts himself. He knows he's gay, but doesn't feel like he'll ever attract anybody. And then he has a crush on a boy in his building who must move into his bedroom for 19 days um, or 15 days um, to by some circumstance. So it's basically like, what is it like to share 
a room with your crush. And if since this is romance month, um, it is so tender and like every little detail is so wonderfully done. And there are some moments of, let's call it romantic confusion. I don't want to ruin them here, but like had me laughing out loud because they were so, so true to life. Like the, the equivalent of, again, like being on the subway and thinking the person is like approaching you to like pick you up or like, or say a compliment. And they're like, Hey, I see you have a watch. What time is it? And you're like, Oh, Oh, that romantic fantasy that was in my head for the past 30 seconds is now dashed. Like this book is that in extremis and it's really well done. So uh, those, those are the two that I will, I will recommend. I see that the links are there uh, again. I strongly encourage everybody to, not just pre-order these books, but please pre-order them and purchase them from Barbara's bookstore. It is an amazing bookstore. It's incredible that they're doing this event with us tonight. Obviously, I would love for you to purchase my books, but please purchase all of these books we're talking about um, and support the bookstore. Yeah, I'm grabbing both of those you just recommended. As Excellent. soon as we're done, I'll be clicking those links over there. <laughs> Because they I mean, I mean, wonderful. You're, you're like the gay romance guy. Like you, you should be all over these. Let me tell you. Especially that second one, because I'm a big fan of like the whole forced proximity thing and being yeah. forced to share that space with your crush. I mean, that's that's some romance gold right there for yep. me. <laughs> David, as we as we welcome Allison back to to help wrap us up. Thank you so much. I have okay, had the best you. time chatting with you. Yeah, this has been great. Thank you both so much. Yes. Oh my gosh. This talk has been incredible. Thank you both so much for being here. Um, I am, oh God, I just feel all gushy because this is such a <laughs> wonderful conversation. Um, everyone, please remember to click on those links in the chat for some of the wonderful books that were recommended today, as well, of course, as 19 Love Songs, which is such an amazing book. Please, please, please click on that link. And don't forget, you get 10% off by using the code EVENT at checkout. So make sure that you also take advantage of that 10% off discount. Uh, we are going to be hosting some amazing events that are coming up in September, so make sure to keep an eye out on our website, all of our social media, um, our Instagram, Facebook, all that stuff. We talk about all of our events and try to let everyone know what's going on. Um, September, we are going to be celebrating Voices, which is all about distinct literary voices. On September 10th, we will be hosting an event that's about rebellion in fiction with Lila Rafi, which I am so excited to talk about. It's going to be so good. Um, and then also don't forget to make sure to check out the other events that we offer, such as our new inclusive book club called Culture Exposure, which is an anti-oppression, anti-racist book club. Um, our first one is actually tomorrow night. And even if you haven't read the book, that's okay, because we'll still just be kind of talking about it generally um, and kind of hopefully entice you to pick up the book. Um, and our first one is going to be Octavia's Brood, Short Stories for Social Justice Movements. So it's writers from marginalized communities that were inspired by Octavia. Oh my gosh. I'm blanking on her last name. Butler. To me. Thank you, Octavia Butler. Thank you. <laughs> I was like, where did my brain go? Hey. But that is happening tomorrow night at 6 p.m. So please, please, please join us. Um, and thank you both again for being here. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, David. Well, thanks, Allison. Thank you. Alrighty. Have a great night, everyone. Happy reading. Good night, everyone.